So now to introduce our speaker. In the fall of 1993, when I started law school at KU, one of the very first faculty members I met was Professor Christine Arguello. And she served on our law faculty from 1991 to 1999. Um, and then she returned eventually to her native state of Colorado. And I'll get to um, all of the various um, uh, opportunities and, and, and legal jobs she, she had in just a second. But I wanted to touch upon um, how, I, how I got to know her. It was my very first day at Green Hall. In fact, I had shown up for uh, first year orientation. And for those of you who remember, I remember first year orientation, it's held in room 104. And, and uh, you know, you show up, you get your packet, you go sit down, you're pretty scared. Uh, all those things. And I remember that I was very, very frightened uh, to be at, in law school. And one of the first people that I did see that, that morning after registering was um, Professor Arguello. And I'm not sure who made introductions first, whether it was her or whether it was me, but I do remember seeing her beautiful, infectious smile. It was just so welcoming. And I have to tell you, I'm not sure whether it was the fear in my eyes or what it was, but she um, immediately tried to reassure me that I was going to be fine, that law school was going to be okay, I was going to get through it, um, and it just meant the world to me. So I wanted to thank her for that publicly because that conversation was so comforting and it was actually um, that experience and that interaction with her that gave me the confidence to show up to the first day of law school the next day. Over the next few years, um, as I uh, <clears throat> was in Green Hall as a student, I never had Judge Arguello as a teacher because she taught bankruptcy uh, and contracts, not my area of uh, interest. Um, but she was our HALSA advisor, and she definitely served as a key mentor in my life. And I always appreciated two, very, two, two things that she did for me. One, she always had her door open, uh, her office door open to all students. And I remember many times sitting in her office, um, eating uh, all of her, she had a bowl of chocolates at the end of her uh, corner of her desk, and I probably ate half the chocolates every time I sat and chatted with her. Um, so th those were times when I would just show up and chat with her, and, and the, it was just great, great times. Um, also, I was new to Kansas when I came um, to law school, and I really missed my Mexican food, the really good Mexican soul food. And I was desperate for really good traditional Mexican food. And so she invited me to her house um, many times. And the best, what I remember most of all, was her big pot of frijoles in the olla. Um, and now she tells me she didn't make it, her husband did. Um, but uh, that, was, that was comfort food to me, and, and she invited me into her home. And I can't tell you how big of a deal that was for someone who was from, being from the Southwest. I was pretty homesick. I tell these short personal stories as a way for you to get a heartwarming glimpse of a truly remarkable Hispanic woman. Um, just the personal side of, of Judge Arguello. Um, she's had a tremendous career in the law. Uh, she comes from very humble beginnings. She was born in a very small town uh, called Thatcher, Colorado. She graduated from the University of Colorado in 1977, went straight um, from there to Harvard Law School where she graduated in 1980. She was the first member of her family to get a, um, a, a college degree, so she was really a pioneer. She, uh, after graduating from Harvard Law School, she went to work for a uh, couple of law firms in Miami. So she spent some time there working for Valdez, um, no relation to me, uh, Folly, Cobb, and Petri. I'm probably mispronouncing these names. And then as a senior associate at Holland and Hart. As I, I mentioned to you already, she joined the KU Law faculty in 1991, and she taught courses in uh, contracts, bankruptcy, um, and then ran our trial advocacy program for many years. She's also a co-author with Professor Prater's um, Evidence, the Objection Method book that most of you have learned evidence from. Uh, she was involved in that project. 
1999, she left KU Law School and joined um, the, and, and sadly, she, right when I had joined the law faculty, she was leaving, so we never even had the opportunity to um, have that joint experience together. She went on back, to, back home to Colorado and joined the Attorney General's office as a Deputy Attorney General, worked there until she uh, went back into private practice with Davis, Gra Graham, and Stubbs in Denver in 2003. All along, you know, there was, she's been vetted for the Canther for the Tenth Circuit, and then, um, as I may forget to mention, she was even vetted for the Supreme Court back in 2009 when uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, ultimately got the nomination. But she was the teacher. She continued to teach at the University of Colorado and then also at the University of Denver. In 2000, um, let's see, six, she left private practice again, went back to University of Colorado, where she served as its managing senior associate university, university general counsel. And then she held that job until she was appointed in 2008 and assumed the bench um, where she has been for, for the last few years, of course. She has been very um, involved in her community in Denver, and uh, there's just a whole list of, of uh of things that she's done in terms of public service. But just to highlight some, some recent um, work that she's done, she serves on the board of directors uh, of the Center for Legal Inclusiveness. She heads up the Arguello Dream Catchers, a group of lawyers and law students who uh, talk to students about the importance of getting a higher, a higher education. And then she has founded the law school, Si Se Puede, which means um, you can do it in Spanish. A pipeline mentoring students to help college kids um, um, get into law school and actually fund LSAT, uh, you know, their LSAT studying for, for, for LSAT, LSAT exam, obviously, so that they can, can get to uh, good programs. She's won many, many awards. The most recent ones um, that I wanted to mention is in 2013, she was named as a Latina Trailblazer by the Latina's First Foundation. In 2014, she was inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. And then in 2015, she won, which is, I think, really cool, um, the Hispanic National Bar Association Outstanding Latina Judge of the Year Award. And so it is with great affection and pride that I now introduce to you our key speaker, the Honorable Christina Arguello, Judge for the U.S. District Court for the District of Colorado. Good evening. Is that close enough? Sometimes you don't get close enough to the... It is such a pleasure for me to be back here in Lawrence. I can't tell you how much fun I've had today just walking around the law school, visiting with um, faculty members that, that were my mentors and colleagues here, and then tonight seeing some of my former students. I mean, it, it's just wonderful. Um, I loved teaching, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, tonight, I hope you will indulge me. And you kind of have to because you're kind of a captive audience. Um, I'm going to do what old people do. Reminisce about my life and my career in the hopes that by sharing some of the pivotal, pivotal incidents in my life, um, I can provide the younger people here, the law students and some of the younger lawyers, and, and maybe some of the not-so-young people um, that are here tonight with what I call consejos, which are words of wisdom. Um, or advice um, that will help you deal with some of the personal challenges that you may face over the course of your legal career. And, and I'll show you, I'm, I'm really trying to be good. I went through and edited this so I could probably get it down to something that would be okay with you all. Um, first thing I want you to know is that I absolutely love being a lawyer. And I hope you all will love the law as much as I did. And, and I didn't become a lawyer to make money. Um, just, you know, uh, Suzanne gave you a little bit of my background. Um, I actually was very, I grew up in a stereotypical Hispanic family where girls were expected to do all the housework and take care of their brothers and have all the responsibility and no freedom because girls could go out and get pregnant and that would shame the family. So I grew up going, God, why did you make me a girl? You know, why couldn't I be like my brothers who are in there watching TV while as a six-year-old I'm standing on a chair washing dishes? Um, and I thought, life is just so unfair. And when I was about nine or ten, I said, you know what? 
I don't care if I'm a girl. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life and no man's going to tell me I can't. Um, that then led to, I was going to be a school teacher. I, I knew that, that to live the kind of life I wanted to do, that I probably needed to get a professional job, which meant I needed to go to college. Now, I was lucky because in the Hispanic culture I was raised in, girls really were intended to get married and have kids and keep the house. I was the smart one, la lista. Um, and everybody just kind of expected, and my dad encouraged it because he wanted a doctor in the family. Um, he encouraged education, but really for my folks, they neither of them graduated from high school, so for them education was high school. Um, my dad wanted a doctor, so he was really pushing more the, the college and then the medical school. Um, I didn't become a lawyer for the money. I became a lawyer because serendipity entered into my life, and when I was 13 years old, I went to the library, and I happened to pick up a magazine. And in that magazine was an article on lawyers and law schools. And it's the first time it occurred to me, because I've never met a lawyer, I didn't meet a lawyer until I got into law school, that I could be a lawyer. And I didn't know anything about lawyers, except what I saw on TV back then. It was Perry Mason and Jed for the Defense. <laughs> uh, gives you my age. Um, but I said to myself, lawyers love to argue with people. I love to argue with people. <laughs> And I usually win my arguments, so I will make a good lawyer. Um, so that was my decision. Well, the article went on to speak about the law schools, and it mentioned Harvard and said Harvard was the best. I had no idea where Harvard even was. Um, I'm, I'm at this time living in a little town in the middle of the mountains of Colorado called Buena Vista. Uh, which everybody says Buena Vista or Buni. Um, and, and I knew nothing about even where CU was at the time. I really had no idea where Harvard was. I had no idea what it would take to get there. But it said it was the best and that's what I wanted for myself, the best. So it was just a simple matter for me as, well, I'm not rich. My parents aren't going to be able to send me to prep school. I guess to get into Harvard, you have to be the best student, and so I will be the best student. And from that day forward, I, I'm very, you'll know, if you get to know me, I'm very type A and very competitive. Um, from that day forward, it was no longer enough to get an A. I had to have the top A. And if I didn't get it the first time, I'd study harder and I would set the curve the next time because I wanted to get into Harvard and I had to be the best student. So the first consejo that I'm going to give you is that you cannot be afraid to reach for the stars. You, you need to reach for, for your dreams and you can't let anybody hold you back. You need to take charge of your own life. Now, I never told anybody in my little town or even my family that my dream was to go to Harvard because somehow deep down I understood that they would not understand that I had these huge dreams. Um, so it wasn't until my junior year in high school when my English teacher decided to ask us what we were going to do after we graduated from high school. And they started on that end of the room and I sat in the middle. And the first guy says, I'm going to be an engineer and I'm going to the Colorado School of Mines. And the response was, that's really great. Second one said, I'm going to be a hairdresser, I'm going to the Colorado Springs School of Cosmetology. And my classmates clapped and they said, that's great. And I'm listening to them go down the rows and I'm having a raging debate. I'm half listening, having a raging debate in my head saying, do I tell them what my dream is? Will they understand? But they were so accepting and supportive of the others that when it came my time, I decided to do it. And I said, I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to Harvard Law School. And there was absolute silence in that, in that classroom as everybody looked at me. And it seemed to me like an eternity, but I'm sure it wasn't more than a second or two. Uh, but with all the eyes on me, and all of a sudden, it was ha, 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 Chris Martinez thinks she can go to Harvard. And the whole class erupted in laughter. Now, there is nothing that will cut you to the bone more than the laughter of your peers, the people you thought of as your friends, scoffing at your dreams. And I can't tell you, this was after lunch, I don't know how I got through the rest of that day, it's a blur in my mind, except I remember sitting in one of these stalls in the women's room, the girls' bathroom, and as I, because nobody was going to see me cry, that was not going to happen, um, 
and as I was sitting in that stall, I started to doubt myself. And I said, yeah, who do I think I am? My parents didn't even graduate from high school. How am I going to go to Harvard? Now, just to set the stage, I will tell you, I was number one in my class. I was on the student council. I was first chair clarinet in the band. I was president of the drama club. So it's not like I was a nobody. Um, but I started to doubt myself. And as I sat in that stall, the, 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 the flame that was my ambition started to go out. And I don't know where I would be today if I hadn't had my junior teacher, who I realized later was waiting for me in the hallway, but at the time I didn't realize it, and she stopped me. And she looked me in the eye, and she said, Chris, I know you can do it. And that's all it took. One person to believe in me. One person I respected to believe it, who, believe, who believed in me. And I picked myself up and I dusted myself off and I got mad. And I said, by gosh, I'm going to come back to my 10th year reunion and they are going to eat that laughter. <laughs> because I'm going to have my law degree. And you know, I tell you that for a number of reasons, but most important because I wonder to this day, if I had not heard that laughter ringing in my ears, day after day, would I have worked as hard as I did to make sure I got into Harvard Law School? I also tell it to you because all it takes is one person to believe in you, to share with the other that they believe in you, to make you be able to accomplish your dreams. So you have a lot of power. You also have a lot of power to destruct. Now, I don't hold it against my classmates because I was a bit ahead of my time. It was 1968 when I decided I was going to go to Harvard. It was 1972 when I told my classmates I was going to go to Harvard. Harvard didn't admit its first Chicana from the Southwest until 1974. So I was a bit ahead of my time anyway. I was born at the right time. Now, I did go to Harvard, and I'll tell you, it was the three best years and the three worst years of my life. Um, and it was the best years, you know, law school's tough. And I was used to being the best, and it was like I was trying to learn a foreign language that I could not crack the code for. No matter how hard I'd studied, I just still couldn't seem to get it right. So it was a very humbling experience. Um, because I couldn't be the best. And people didn't understand. They said, but it doesn't matter. You're there with the cream of the crop. And I said, I don't care when you're there. You're, you're mediocre. And I've never been mediocre in my life. It's hard. But it was, it, was a, it was a good lesson because what I learned was it was okay not to always be the best as long as you gave it your best. And that's what I decided to do is just to, to try to get the most I could out of my classes, try to take advantage of it, and that way I would be the best lawyer I could be. Now, when I say you need to take charge of your life, an example of that is I wanted to be a trial lawyer. Now, unfortunately, when I was in law school, I was about 90 pounds soaking wet. I looked like I was 16. I had my hair down to here, looked stereotypical Latina, and I did not fit the mold that most of the white male partners, because there were very few female partners, and there were no real diverse partners, they would look at me and say, you don't look like a trial lawyer. I mean, they wouldn't really say that, but that's what they were thinking. <laughs> you know, they'd come out and they'd say, wouldn't you rather do trusts and estates? <laughs> like, no, I wouldn't. Um, and, and I had every intention of just, my husband and I were so homesick, we wanted to go back home after law school. Um, and I went home and I told my husband, they are not even going to give me a chance to prove that I can be an effective advocate. Uh, they're going to put me in some back room and I'm going to be writing briefs for somebody or I'm going to have to be doing wills and trusts. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just wasn't for me. Um, so he says, well, what do we do? And I said, we have to go somewhere else. And he goes, where do we go? And you know, this was before computers, so it was really kind of hard to, to research. You couldn't just <laughs> plug something in. Um, we made our decision very, you know, very, we took a lot of thought into it. We said, okay, we are tired of the northeast cold. Let's go to a warm climate. We chose San Diego and Miami out of the blue. And I ended up in Miami because the firm there hired me to be a trial attorney. Um, and we wanted, you know, we went down there. And I will tell you, for a young professional couple, my husband is a school teacher. You know, I was a lawyer. It was a wonderful city to spend some time in. And I will credit that firm 
with taking what was truly a diamond in the rough, because I was rough, and they polished me up and they nurtured me and they mentored me and they actually made me into the attorney I later became and the judge that I later became because they set that real foundation for me moving forward. So my second consejo to you is going to be to search your heart and soul. Decide what it is you really want to, out of life. What will make you excited to wake up every morning and jump out of bed knowing that you're going to spend your day doing what you really love to do? And once you decide on that, then give it your all. I graduated from, from Harvard in 1980 and I went into private practice and I'm a very goal-oriented person. That's the other thing I've learned about myself throughout my life. Um, and when you go into a law firm, what's your goal? To make partner. So once again, I put my nose to the grindstone and I worked really hard and I, I started to learn though that there were these things called politics, even in law firms. Um, and I somehow intuitively sensed that my hard work alone was not going to be enough to, to get me to make partner in this law firm. Um, I decided I needed to find the most respected and most influential partner in that firm with whom I had some sort of natural rapport and then make myself indispensable to that partner. And that's what I did. Now at the time, I didn't even know that what I was looking for was a mentor. That came about later, but that's what it was. And I'm sure you've heard this from a lot of people, but I can't emphasize it enough. It is going to be critical for you that no matter what job you take, what position you have, you have to find an influential mentor who will help you out. And what I did is just made myself indispensable to them. I knew that if I didn't make partner, I, mean, I knew he was going to speak up for me at the partner meetings, I knew he was going to toot my horn for me, I wouldn't have to do it myself because if I didn't make partner, his clients were really going to be ticked off because they loved me and I made him look good. That's how I made partner. It wasn't because I was so, so good. I wasn't a big rainmaker at the time. I was still working my way towards that. So you can't wait for a mentor to find you. You have to be assertive enough to go out and look for that mentor yourself um, and as I said, find somebody with whom you have a natural rapport. Now, my fourth consejo is going to be, don't be afraid of change. And this comes from the fact that I came to realize that so many people stay in the job that they're in, even if they're unhappy or unfulfilled, merely because they are afraid of change. And I have never been afraid of change. And I will tell you, don't be afraid of change. It is what energizes you. Uh, as I say, one of my, when I went to the University of Colorado, the, the general counsel recruited me there. And two years later, he told me he was retiring. I said, wait, Charlie, you bring me in and then you leave me? And he goes, Christy, I've never dived off a cliff the way you have. Now, I consider myself to be really risk averse, so I never thought of myself as diving off a cliff. Uh, and he, he said, sure, you just decide you're going to take some totally, you know, you went from private practice to academia. Then you went from that to state government, and then, you know, he said, you're not afraid. I've, I've been in-house counsel my entire life for educational. He said, I want to try something totally different. So don't be afraid to dive off a cliff at least once in your life. Now, I made partner Holland and Hart, and I was um, on the school board. I was the youngest person ever elected to the Colorado Springs School Board, and I did that because I love education. Everybody thought I was making my stepping stone to politics. I said, I'd make a horrible politician. I can't lie to people. <laughs> you know, they look me in the eye and ask me a question, I give you the straightforward answer. Um, I just love education and policy, and I was doing so much, I said, I might as well have a, a say in it. So I was doing well, I was making more money than I ever dreamed possible, and then for reasons I did not understand, I was restless, and I stopped rolling out of bed in the morning, excited to go to work, and I really thought there was something mentally wrong with me. So I went to a counselor and talked to him, and he helped me to see that I am a type A personality who was very competitive and very goal oriented and once I accomplish my goal it's kind of time for the new challenge. Um, so I decided that once I made partner that I needed to scale a new mountain and I chose teaching um, basically because I love to teach and mentor. Um, my goal I got hired and I'll tell you a little bit more about that too. My goal was to gain tenure and to get promoted. That's what you do when you go into to academia. 
Um, and I, I came here to KU, and I tell you, um, it was one of the best experiences, and I love my colleagues. I love being in Lawrence, Kansas. It's a great place to raise a family. But once I achieved tenure, guess what happened? <laughs> I got restless again, and it was like, what is my next mountain to scale? And I'll be honest with you, my dream at that time was that I would become the first female dean of KU Law School. And several of my colleagues told me that I had a good shot at becoming dean. But that was not to be. One of my strengths is that I'm a very good observer of others, and I'm really good at reading between the lines. And when that deanship opened up, it became apparent to me that the powers that be had decided whom they wanted to be the heir, and that was not me. And so it was at that time that I realized that if I wanted to continue to scale my mountains, I was going to have to return home to Colorado, where I was the native daughter. So once again, I took charge of my future and um, moved my family back to Colorado after only a 15-minute conversation on the phone with then-elected Attorney General Colorado. I had actually gone back intending to do a look-see visit at the University of Colorado and then Ken Salazar called me. It was He tracked me down up in my cabin, which has no phone. It was our neighbors. And I'm like, Ken, how did you find our neighbor's phone? <laughs> he, was, he was tenacious. So I had a 15-minute conversation with him. And I said, maybe this is what God wants for me. So uh, my husband says, take it, take it. And I said, what are we going to do? He had to come back and sell the house and move us and do everything. But I took that job at that point, and I think that's really... Um, where I was intended to be at that time. Now, I'm not going to bore you with each of the stories about my job changes. As some people, my critics, would say I can't hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, I just like new challenges. Um, and then I was talking to somebody else here, and so I'm going to raise this. My sixth consejo is going to be never allow the golden handcuffs to restrain you. And actually, I think it was one of those students over here. And this one hasn't been too difficult for me because I never went into the law to make money. Um, and I'll give you an example. When I decided to come to the University of Kansas, um, I was a partner in my firm, so any, any teaching job I took was going to be about a 50% pay cut. I actually received eight job offers from different academic institutions um, in the mostly the West and Southwest and Midwest. And Kansas was actually the lowest money offer I received. But, but, why did I come to Kansas? Because the faculty here was fabulous. Um, they really wanted me here. I received more phone calls and more letters from the faculty here at KU than all of the others put together. And that makes a difference. Um, I knew that this faculty was not going to sit back with their arms crossed saying, are you good enough for us? No, they were going to get out there and help me ensure that I succeeded. And they did. And, and as I said, it has been wonderful here to, to, to get out and see the faculty that are still here, that were here when I was there. Um, but it was a huge pay cut. And when I, went to Kate, when I left here to go to Ken Salazar, one of the questions I asked him in that 15-minute phone call is, Ken, how much does this job pay? Uh, and I'll let you know, I, I knew Ken because there was a handful, uh, there were a handful of Latino lawyers who had, had gone to national law schools who were with the big firms at the time, and he was one of them, but I wasn't really close friends with him. Um, and he said, $75,000. Now that was less than I was making on my nine month teaching job here at KU. And I was like, how am I going to support my family? Um, but as I told my son, because my 13-year-old son made that argument to me exactly, because he didn't want to leave Kansas. He did not want to leave, and he said, Mom, how does this make sense for our family? <laughs> you're uprooting all of us, and you're taking us to Colorado, and you're making less than you're making here. And I told him that I hoped when he grew up that he would come to understand that it was, should never be about the money. When it comes to something as important as your career and your work, it is about being challenged and excited about what you do and about giving back to your community. And this was an opportunity for me to practice government law, which I'd never done, and to work with a leader like Ken Salazar. Um, and at the time, as you probably know, he became Senator Salazar and then Secretary of Interior Salazar. 
Um, and I will tell you, we struggled a bit financially. I have to use my kids' college fund to help pay the bills. Um, but it was the right decision in so many ways, uh, ways that I didn't even envision when I accepted Ken's offer after only that 15-minute phone conversation. I will tell you, nobody can ever accuse me of not being decisive. Um, what I really appreciated about that is that I got to, to you know, do some of the most satisfying legal work that I've ever done. I got to argue cases before the Colorado Supreme Court, before the Tenth Circuit, and I believe that I actually improved the life for and protected the people of the state of Colorado. Um, and from a personal perspective, I can tell you that but for my going to work for Ken Salazar, I would not be addressing you as Judge Arguello today. Because uh, there were so many problems. You think politics are bad in academia? <laughs> Wait till you get to appointing lifetime judges. Um, if it had not been for my being willing to take that pay cut and go to work for Ken, then he would not have known that I was worth the fight. And he had to fight. I was a compromised candidate. I was originally nominated by President Clinton. And then I was later, that was for the 10th Circuit, and I never got a hearing because it was closer to an election year. I went into the black hole for eight years. And then um, at the end of President Bush's term, I was a compromised candidate. We had three vacancies on our court, and Ken essentially told them, um, you give me Christie and I'll give you one Republican. You don't give me Christie and you're getting nobody and we will wait to see who wins the election and if Obama wins we will put three Democrats on that bench. So they, they compromised and it was a Republican and me. Now I will tell you, I told Ken, Ken, I am worth two Republicans. <laughs> All right, my last consejo is that when you achieve your success, um, don't be one of those people whom we all know who make it and never look back and never hold out a hand to help somebody else come forward. They believe they did it on their own and none of us does it on our own. I wouldn't be here but for the help of so many people, so many mentors, um, so many people who are willing to give. Um, and I believe we all have an obligation to reach back, to help others climb that mountain by mentoring them, by opening doors for them, by helping to train them, by networking them. And this is one of the reasons I spend so much time mentoring and talking to young people and why I spend time you know, coming here to talk to, to, to people at, at, at um, events like this. And that leads me to the last point that I want to share with you. Why does KU hold the Diversity in Law Banquet each year. And why are all of you here year after year? I hope it is because you know that to become a lawyer is to obtain power. <coughs> lawyers make the law, lawyers interpret the law, lawyers execute the law, and sometimes to devastating effect. Yet, if the, there is unequal access up to this most powerful of professions and the law's very effectiveness is eroded and upended if we don't have representation across the board. Despite years of attempting to address diversity or the lack of diversity, we have only had modest gains in, in, in the nation in minority enrollment in law schools and in 2012 only 25 percent of law students and 12 percent of attorneys were people of color compared to almost 40% of the United States population. That's why you hold this banquet, to address those problems. Now after years, I got tired of hearing Colorado firms lament the fact that they could not get diverse because they couldn't attract enough diverse people to Colorado. And in 2014, two years ago, I decided enough of this. If the problem is that we can't attract them to Colorado, then why don't we start raising our own? I do a lot of speeches in schools mostly to give them inspiration, the kids inspiration. I want them to see that I came from their background. And in the United States of America, if you are willing to not be afraid to dream big and work hard, you can achieve in one generation from, you know, uh, my parents didn't graduate high school, I graduated Harvard Law School. In one generation you can make that change. And they can't be afraid to dream big. So we started brainstorming and, you know, talking about, okay, how was it, and I'll ask you this, if you had 
to describe your path to your professional success as a lawyer in just a few words, what would those words be? Well, for me, when I was talking to them, I said, big dreams, hard work, and a lot of serendipity. And my law clerks at the time looked at me and said, we understand the first two, but serendipity? And I said, yes, as I look back on my life, there's no way to put it. Serendipity or fortunate happenstance play such, played such a significant role in defining the, life my path, my, the path my life would take. If I hadn't picked up that magazine when I was 13 years old, where would I be? Would it even have occurred to me to become a lawyer? Because I didn't meet a lawyer until I was in law school. Um, and I will tell you, along the way, I was fortunate to have mentors like Ellen Sward, who when I came to KU, um, gave me her entire set of materials, her, her, her lecture notes, her everything for my, my, my debtor creditor course. Now she, I mentioned that to her earlier, and she says, I was so happy to get rid of that course. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't have to help me that way. She wanted to make sure I succeeded, and she was one of the biggest mentors I had. I, luck, I was fortunate enough to have an office next to her. And I remember, the, I got my first teaching evaluations for my small section. I thought I was doing such a good job. And I was, but of course you never focus on the good evaluations. <laughs> I read them right before I went to bed at night. Don't ever do that. <laughs> and they were all real positive. I hit one, and it was devastating. This young lady said, I am dropping out of law school because of Professor Arguello. I'm like, oh my God, I just ruined somebody's <laughs> career. And she said, she, sets, she, she holds us to a Harvard standard, and that is unfair. And I'm going, no, I was holding you to the standard that you need to have to succeed in, law, in the law practice. And I came to, to work the next day totally devastated. And I went to Ellen and I said, Ellen, I failed as a professor. And she goes, Christy, what were your other, law, what were your other evaluations like? Well, they were good. And they were really very good. But that's the one I focused on. She says, they have to have somebody to blame, so it's going to be you. So, you know, she was such a, a tremendous moral support for me. And I will tell you, one of the, the honors I'm most proud of here is I won the first... Uh, for the law school, they started this program called the William T. Kemper Teaching Excellence Award. Uh, I won the first one for the law school, but I only won it because my other mentor and friend here, John Head, took the time and championed my nomination. He's, he did a fabulous nomination. That's when I, he, I learned from him, and believe it or not, you know, this is like well into my career. Presentation is everything. <laughs> and, and it was, he, he put together this beautiful packet, and it took him hours to do it, I'm sure. He drafted a phenomenal nomination in me. I'm going, that's me? Uh, and, and I got the award, but only because he was willing to take the time to champion me. If he hadn't bothered to nominate me, nobody would ever have known it. So I challenge you to look around your colleagues and champion somebody. They don't get awards if they're not nominated, and you all can make a difference. I, I now nominate all kinds of people um, because I think it's important for us to give that extra support. Now, getting back to my original story, I thought, okay, so if the problem is that we can't attract diverse attorneys to Colorado, then one, let us raise our own, and two, we can take away that serendipity we can be their serendipity. So together with the group of lawyers who are my Arguello Dream Team, we're the group that goes around and talks to students all over the state of Colorado to inspire them to go to higher education, we developed this program that I call Law School Si Se Puede. And despite its name, it's not just a Hispanic program. Um, well, we, it's a new pipeline mentoring program and we, I'm targeting, I'm trying to level the playing field for anybody who needs to have it leveled. Um, so it's low income, first generation college, or of color. And what we do is we set up, a, what we call them fellows, our fellows are admitted to the program, and I know that sounds like sexist, but no, it was really after like the Rhodes Fellowship and some of that to make it a little more prestigious. We pair each fellow, we take between 10 and 15 students a year, they have to graduate from a Colorado high school. Um, they have to be interested in pursuing a legal career, so they've done mock trial or moot court or debate. 
Um, and they have to be seniors graduating starting their first year of college. And we chose college because there are so many programs that are there for K through 12. There are so many programs that are for them after they get into law school. But the fact of the matter is, for low income and, and first generation and kids of color, we lose them. I mean, if they graduate from high school, and we lose a lot of them before they even do that, we lose them their freshman year of college because they go and they are so overwhelmed by the experience and they don't have anybody in their family to help get them through. So we specifically targeted freshman students. We paired them with three mentors. Two lawyers, one at the senior level, one at the mid to junior level, and one law student. And all of these lawyers, all of these mentors, and the, and the fellows have to make a four-year commitment. This is four years of mentoring um, um, through the entire college career, and it takes them five years, and it's going to be five years of mentoring, but hopefully we'll get them through in four years. We, we you know, give advice such as what courses to select, what work or internship experience they should get. They provide emotional support. Um, and and the, the real um, thrust of the program is to help demystify the process of applying to law school and getting admitted. And then once they're admitted, demystifying law school for them. We also, though, I said mentoring's not enough. We have to provide some, some workshops, some classes for them. So we, every other month, we have skill building and exposure program workshops um, on logical reasoning, internship opportunities, resume writing, and interview skills. Um, inter and insiders look at the law school admissions process where both admissions directors from the law schools come in and talk to them about this is what an application looks like, this is what we consider important. Freshman year, so they can be thinking about it their entire college career, what they need to do to set them up, and the goal is to have them admitted to the law school of their choice. Doesn't have to be Harvard, doesn't have to be CU, you know, it's whatever they have researched, and we teach them how to research law schools, that will, will, will meet what their particular needs are. Now, you would say, so I now have 26 kids in the program because we started in 2014. We had 12 that year. We have 14 this past year. Um, we, that means we have to have about 78 mentors. And you would say, wow, that must be pretty difficult. I have people on the waiting list to be mentors because they realize, I mean, what we're doing is we're giving them all the advice we never had. And they're either volunteering because they wish they had had that advice or they did have it and they know what a difference it made for them. So in our first class, we have 10 Hispanics, two black students. Our second class in 2015, we had 14 students, two black, one Anglo, one Asian, and 10 Hispanic. Now, we're heavily weighted to Hispanic because I'm the head of the program and I'm kind of the face. And the only media that would pick us up is Univision and La Voz. So the word gets out to a lot of the Hispanic community, but we are not just Hispanic. Um, we will be accepting our third year of cla uh, uh, class of fellows this year, which means the program's even growing bi bigger. So we, I think we're on the right track. If you read anything, um, the New York Times recently had a piece that confirms that the time we are committing to mentoring of these fellows is going to be time that is well spent because it will have the most influential impact on their future development in college. Now, I am currently working with judges in New York, Texas, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and California to help them set up programs in those, those jurisdictions. And I'm making a challenge to you here today. I don't know if there are any judges here. Are there any judges here? Well, you guys gotta get your judges to start coming to these programs. <laughs> um, lawyers who are here, I am challenging you to set up a similar program here in Kansas or in Missouri um, and I will provide, I will, I will commit to you that as I do to the other judges I'm working with, we, will, we have developed this program from the ground up. I thought it was going to be easy, I thought we'd just go plagiarize somebody's materials. <laughs> we got on the internet, there are no programs like this anywhere else. There are some at colleges, specific colleges, there are some with scholarship programs, but there's nothing. I mean, our kids go to school, I have kids in Syracuse, I have them at Chicago Loyola, I have them at Baylor, and I have them all throughout Colorado. 
So we don't limit them to going in state. We just they have to be from Colorado or at least graduating because they are more likely to come home to Colorado if they leave or they're more likely to stay. So we are drilling our own pipeline for diverse attorneys in Colorado. I will I will provide you with everything we've developed. I will help you. I will guide um, you all through how to set up a program. We even live stream our programs, our workshops because we have the out-of-state kids. I invite the other judges, have your, have your mentor, uh, your fellows, dial in, here's the, here's the, here's the um, link. And I will, I will commit to you that I will do that to help you set up a program. So Steve, I'm gonna leave it to you, to, Stephen, I'm sorry, to follow up with them and see if anybody's interested. I do have uh, a newsletter. If you go though, we have a website. You can read all about the program and, and, and read blog posts. We make our, our fellows write because I said writing is going to be critical. They Each year they have to do a blog post um, of at least 300 words about something that they've learned um, either through the program or through their, their year in college. Um, and it, it's just been fabulous to see these young people. I mean, they are experts at networking. Um, you know, we take them out. I, I, the other thing that we do is invite them. If I were to give a speech in, like this in Colorado, I will take at least one or two of them, and I make them work the room. Um, and they've gotten internships. That's the other thing is, is providing internship opportunities for them so they get to work in a professional environment, get some exposure. We've gotten um, not so much luck with the law firms, but I have government agencies, city attorney's office has really stepped up. I have a few private corporations that will, and, and these are generally volunteer, but I have a corporation this year that's going to pay them. It's fifteen dollars an hour, but that's better than they can get waiting tables, probably. So, and it gives them that professional environment um, to do it in. So, I do have a few newsletters, but you can go on to our website. It's called Law School Si Se Puede dot org. And I want to just share with you uh, a quote from one of the attorney who's, her, attorneys who was part of my dream team who helped set this up, and this is how he put the mission. The mission of Law School Si Se Puede is to level the playing field in terms of the information that students have when they are beginning to think about a legal career. I was the first in my family to graduate from college and I came from a community in rural Texas. So when I applied to law school I had no idea about the benefits from my resume of doing certain internships in college or taking a prep course to study for the law school admissions test. The goal of this program is to make up for those types of deficits, ones that are especially felt by those who come from communities that are underrepresented in our profession. So with that, I am hopeful that my path will continue to cross with each of yours, and I wish you all very much success in your lives, in your careers, and success will have different meanings for you at different points in your life. And I remember when I thought success was, you know, becoming a partner in the law firm, getting tenure you know, at KU. And those are not bad things. Those are important things to strive for. But as I've gotten older and I've gained more wisdom, the meaning of success has changed for me. And I end all of my speeches so with this poem, so you're going to have to indulge me. It's entitled Success. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and endure the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty. To find the best in others. To leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know that even one life has breathed easier because I have lived. This is to have succeeded. Thank you.